Well, uh, it's four minutes uh, pa past four, so I think it's a good idea to to start. So first of all, uh, welcome to to everyone to to this new session of, of TASI seminar. And today it's my pleasure my pleasure to to introduce uh, Luis Martin Rousseau. We would like also to to thank him for for being here here to and um, for this uh, amazing talk I'm sure it's going to be. So Luis Martin Rousseau is a professor in the Department of Mathematics and Industrial Engineering at uh, at uh, Ecole Polytechnique de Montreal. Since 2016, uh, he has held the Canada Research Chair in Healthcare Analytics and Logistics, which studies complex and interconnected problems in home care services, cancer treatment, and hospital uh, logistics. Uh, Professor Rousseau was also the co-founder and chief science officer of Plan Nora before its acquisition by JDA in 2012, where he served as, uh, as a scientific advisor afterward. With the students and colleagues, he, has, he recently co-founded Gray Oncology Solution, which proposes a patient scheduling a software as a service solution to the health sector. Well, the title of this talk is Data Driving Models for Efficient Healthcare Delivery. So, Professor Rousseau, the floor is yours. Um, that's all. Thank you very much. I hope the sound is good. Um, yeah. um, I have a bit of a sore throat today, so I might need to take some pots for water. Um, Okay, so this talk will be um, a little bit more focused around cancer treatment. I uh, My original idea to include everything we did was not, not realistic within uh, 60 minutes, so I focused a little bit more around what we did in cancer in the last decade or so. Um, just to give you an example, this is these are the statistics in Canada, um, right? People are getting diagnosed every minute or basically every more than, than every minute in the US and, and every five minutes or so in Canada. and um, Although it's getting better, uh, cancer is still the first cause of mortality um, among the, the Canadian populations, and I think most of Western developed country as well. The situation will not improve with aging a population because we know that cancer is, um, is a disease that is age-related and our Western populations are aging fast. So what can we do? Um, the idea behind the work we have done in the chair is really to focus around how to make the existing uh, resources more efficient and how we can um, work toward improving the speed of treatment and uh, the quality of care, right? So how do we keep not the same quality, but we treat more people? Um, this talk is going to focus more about radiation therapy, but we did work on uh, chemotherapy and, and surgery as well. But the bulk of what we did over the years started and is still ongoing around radiation therapy. So we'll, we'll discuss that. Um, as you can see, there are different ways of treating the cancer. If it's more early stage, we typically have a surgeon take out the tumor. If it goes into later stage, you need more chemotherapy to uh, <clears throat> attack all the metastases that can go uh, everywhere in your body. Radiation therapy is a bit in the middle, and roughly about half of the patients who are diagnosed with cancer will um, have radiation therapy within the course of their treatment. So uh, radiation therapy is not, I mean, although it looks fancy and very modern approach, it's, it still is more than 70 year old. The first, uh, sorry, 60 year old. The first uh, prototype was uh, produced in the 60. At the time you used a fixed radiation source. <clears throat> so here in the end, you would put some cobalt or something like that. And then you would kind of shape it and then it would manually move this and then open and close the door and so forth. Um, that uh, was not very safe for the patient. Nowadays, you have what are called linear accelerators, so they create the radiation and, and produce photon as needed. So it's a much more complex machine that you know, it rolls around the table and that uh, can have multiple, um, multiple, multiple parameters. So I'll show you that a bit uh, later down uh, the talk. If you compare uh, radiation therapy to chemotherapy, in, um, in chemotherapy, we all know that you have an oncologist, then some pharmacist produces um, 
sorry, some pharmacist produces, uh, which one are you seeing? I'm on the radiation therapy. Okay. For some reason, it's not showing me the correct stuff, but let me, let me see. So you're still seeing my uh, my presentation? Yeah, yeah, it's perfect. Yeah. Perfect. So in the chemotherapy, you um you would have an oncologist, a pharmacist, and then that would prepare the drug, and then a nurse would inject you in what is called an infusion center. In radiation oncology, the um, the, the 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 doctors call a radiation oncologist, and then some physics, the physics department with physical. A medical physicist and then those images prepare a treatment using a computer i'll come back to that and then it, what is called a therapist which is the equivalent of a nurse will uh treat the patient and there are several steps typically that comes from the referral the first appointment um the preparation like scanning the patient understanding where is the tumor then preparing the treatment then actually giving the treatment and then having follow-up um visits later but this might look simple but actually it's a very complex process this is the detailed process flow diagram of what happens in a very small regional hospital. Um, if you look at university hospital, it is way, way more complex than that. Um, radiation therapy is one of the few areas of medicine where actually a lot happens without the patient, right? So the most of the treatment and the action is, is done on a computer when the patient is at home, and only when that's done, the patient comes and, and gets treated. Um, Okay, so let's get more into the details of that. Um, the first step is called simulation. It requires understanding where is the tumor <clears throat> and how we're going to treat it. So the patient will go in a room where there's a typically a CT scan. Uh, it also you no know, more modern approach using MRI or PET scan. Um, they're used for, for understanding the position of the tumor. And it's important that, that this position relative to the rest of the body is fixed. So as you see here, you would eventually mold something on the head of the patient if the cancer is in the head or you would put some tattoos or some you know, um, ink mark on the body to make sure that you position well. And then you might see the image is moving. There is some laser um, lasers in the radar. You can see them here. That helps to position the patient with respect to the laser so that when you actually go in the later room, you, you know how to reproduce this position. Then once you have a detailed um, 3D image of the body, this is where a lot of the stuff happens. Then you will use, uh, it's called treatment planning software, which are heavy mathematical optimization models that will figure out <clears throat> how to shoot the radiation through the body such that the, the radiation enters and meets at the tumor to uh, eat it up and make it die while sparing most of the organ at risk and normal tissues around that. Um, and this is a big, um, is a big challenge nowadays it, with the power of, of the new algorithms in the machine it's more or less under control but it's been a very vast area of studies for more than, than 20 years i will discuss that uh, in a second part of the talk um, and then uh, the plan gets approved by the doctor and still even though the the models are good the models today do not really capture what the doctor wants right because uh, we'll talk about that but it's a bit uh, uh, it's related to conditional value at risk, for example, or something like that. And it's it's very difficult <clears throat> to implement this formulation at the size of those models. So we use a proxy, and therefore there's a ping pong that happens between the therapist that uses the computer and what the doctor really wants. And the doctor can say that he's not happy, annotate it, and then it will, it will circle back like that. When everybody is happy, then the patient is actually ready to treat. So he comes back, now sits on the real machine where there are some lasers, and they will align the lasers on the mark um, on the body or put the same mask so that the patient is in the exact same position that he was during the, the treatment. And uh, uh, this time we actually send real radiation um, nodes, basically 100 times more powerful in X-ray through uh, the body. And we try to do that as the most efficient way as possible because it's not necessarily super comfortable out there with a the big machine rotating around you. So this is the process of radiation therapy. Now, normally the last step in the past, you would do that 30 to 40 times for breast or prostate cancer. Now they're working to something called hypofractionation, <clears throat> which gives you more radiation, but you become less often, let's say five to 10 times or something. Okay, so the outline of this talk is the following. In the first part, we're going to focus really on scheduling and two aspects, a real, um, let's say a more classical mathematical decomposition method that allows to schedule 
uh, the patients on the, on the real center. And then something we just did recently using the data from the first project and working with the university hospital, we, we made a prototype where we actually use a prediction-based model <clears throat> to uh, schedule the patient. And the second part of the talk, we'll see how we can use data to speed up the treatment planning. So this deciding how the, 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 the radiation traverses the body. First, um, speeding up traditional algorithm, and then the second one using reinforcement learning to try to improve um, the treatment time for cyber knife uh, robots. All right, so let's jump into it. The first thing, how do we speed up? How much time do we need and uh, before the patient is diagnosed and the patient gets treated, right? To do everything that we think uh, that we, uh, sorry, that I just showed needs to be done in between. Well, one of the key issues is that the, the, the schedule is not empty, right? So whenever a patient comes in, there's a bunch of other patients that are getting treated at a time and they might have all <clears throat> sets of different treatment length and days. And so the machines are already pretty full. Also, the patients, they typically come in four categories, but we'll focus only around three. So I'm not showing here what is called P1. So P1 are super urgent, do right now. Um, and so typically you stop everything and you do, do those patients, but there are very, very few of them. So we don't we don't handle them because we can't really plan for them. The, the, the bulk of the rest of the patients are, are what we call palliative. So these are P2s. So palliatives are patients um, that don't have a good prognostic, so they're mostly in the end of life and they're suffering. And radiation therapy is a way to go um, destroy a tumor that's causing pain. So if they have a tumor on the spinal cord or in the brain um, and that's creating either mental problems or, or high pain, you can go and, and destroy it. Of course, you give more high dose and so you can destroy a bunch of the stuff around it, but you're just trying to alleviate pain. And, and so you can't wait because the patient is suffering. And so you try to get those patients done within three days. And then you have the curatives uh, three and four are the patients for which uh, radiation therapy is actually the cure. So curative ones is the patient where radiation therapy is the main source um, of treatment. So you want to get them you know, as fast as possible on the machine because the, the tumor is continuing to grow until you get the radiation to them. So you, you need to hurry. The, the P4s are patients that had surgery before, so they most likely don't have any more any tumor, but just you want to be sure that you, the surgeon didn't miss a tiny piece that can regrow, so you would give them low-dose radiation therapy, so it's kind of a safety net, and so you have a bit more time with them because anything major has been taken away by the surgeon already. Um, the key issue or the difficulty is that those urgent patients, they account for about 30% of the volume, so you can't really ignore them and deal with them as they come because there's just too many of them. Okay, so how can we do that, right? You could do stochastic optimization. So a lot of people have, have worked on that, um, but you need scenarios and it's a quite um, difficult to, to tackle that at this size because you have um, a lot of patients, a lot of machines and a lot of variability. And um, if you, and don't, you don't need that, you don't have a lot of time to, to solve the, the problem because the patients, they need an appointment. You also don't have a clean slate. You have uh, the existing appointment sets and you need to get them um, respect them because if you if you play around with the existing schedule, then you need to call all the patients to tell them the appointments have moved, and that's really a lot of of, of calls and a burden on the on the um, the clerks. So you don't want to do that really. Okay, the um, a lot of people have studied using Markov decision process as a way to model that, um, but the um, um, let me wait a second. Um, so the, um, the Markov decision process, the issue is that it's generate, um, um, a steady state, not assume steady state, and that, uh, causes, um, um, problems with the fact that, that you have long tails. For example, if you have a surge of patients, then your system will, will be very, um, no, occupied and will will come into a, a mode where it's clogged up and it will take a lot of time because some of the patients they come for 30 or 40 appointments it will take a lot of time to come down but because the markup decision process assumes steady states it's assuming that <clears throat> that things are more or less always around the mean and, and normal and doesn't assume for context and so that creates a, a, a set of, of issues when you apply that in reality so what we, we aim to do in the end was really to work on, on the idea of online optimization, 
which is where you know, when the when you take it, you need to take one decision one by one, and then you can't revisit them in the future. So you can think of it as, for example, ad placement. When uh, you open a web page, then the, the browser will position um, ads on that, and then when it places an ad, it cannot take it away, right? It's, it's been called. Um, and so by using this kind of framework where you need to take the decision one by one, you are able to, to assist the clerk into booking the patient one by one as they go. However, we're going to have a different twist to that. Um, we're going to use something called online stochastic combinatorial optimization, which was a framework introduced by um, Pascal Van Tenrick and Russell Bent, where you actually, before you make an online decision, you also run a fast stochastic model to try to get an idea of what's to come, right? Online models typically ignore a future prediction of what is coming. And um, stochastic programs are very good at estimating the future, but they're they're designed to take a vast number of decisions at the same time. So we're looking at something in between. So for every solution, so for every new patient that comes, what we will do is we will try to compute a utilization cost for a time slot. So saying basically how much uh, each time cost virtually cost, and then we'll commit the appointment um, to the best possible um, position. And to do that, we will do the following two things. We'll build a, a booking model using a Benzig-Wolf decomposition method, and we'll tackle the uncertainties around the patients that are to come around the vendor's um, decomposition. Okay, so that's the book that I've mentioned. Uh, it's quite famous by now, and they use it using consensus method and uh, different kind of heuristic to achieve those kind of computation for the the value, uh, the virtual value of a time slot, but we will use mathematical optimization for that. So this is the way we're going to do it. We first enumerate patterns of visits. So for example, um, if a patient comes, you can either start him on day number eight, so that will be pattern zero. And if you if you start him on day on pattern zero, then you would pay um, eight times one uh, cost because you would delay him by eight days, right? So you start that patient was ready, but you still pay for the, even when the patient's not ready. So you would you would start him here and pay a unit of eight. If you start using pattern one and you start them on day 16, then you have you, you wait 16 days to start the treatment, but you also pay uh, two days of penalty because you started after the maximum delay of 14 days, you start on day 16. So there's two times a penalty of 50, okay? And then, um, we, we assume here for this first project that you cannot start within the first seven days because this is the amount of time you need to um, plan the patient and compute the dosimetry and get the, the doctors to agree with the computer and so forth. In the second project, we did uh, revisit that, um, but we um, I don't think I have time to discuss about that today. So the stochastic model looks like this. Um, Essentially, we have this constraint here, which says that no, only one patient can be on the table at a given amount of time. And we have constraint for each machine and for each time slot. So this is what we're looking to understand the value of. So we're looking in a sense that the dual value of that constraint gives us an idea of the marginal cost of putting a patient on the table at that time. Okay, and how do we estimate that? We actually, um, we will actually, using a vendor's decomposition method, we will relax this constraint and send it in the objective. And then, um, sorry, and then this estimation will give us the, um, the, the reduced cost of that constraint. And then the, that marginal cost, uh, we, you know, we can just compare them for all the slots, and then we will choose the greedy, the pattern with the best uh, reduced cost. So when we tested that on the on the center, that was a regional center that just opened up in the in the 2013 or 14. We had uh, two machines, 23 slots each, and uh, they were just starting. And we compared against what they were doing. So CICL is the name of the center. They were basically delaying the delaying the the like booking the palliative right away. The <clears throat> curative one, they were doing them right away, and then the curative two, they were delaying them. Um, and then doing them, um, starting them at 14 days and then doing them ASAP after 14 days. And we can see that using our method, we were able to, to still significantly reduce the number of patients that were violating the delay and reducing over time, right? So they, they would, if, they, if they're going to violate the delay, their first uh, 
a recourse function would be to go over time, but there's a limit on the amount of overtime that you can use in a week. It's a few hours. So when you reach that, then you go um, you go and violate delays. So here you could see that now they were practically at the maximum, probably was around 45 or something like that, um, hours of overtime. And we could really reduce that and reduce uh, the delays for the, um, the other patient. Um, that was that worked well, but the model was still complex, and the example, I mean, this problem was still very small, and and we could we really exploited the fact that all the appointments were uh, similar; they had all the same duration, and because the regional center, they're not doing any of the complex treatment that take more time. So now, when we fast forward, uh, let's say close to ten years, <clears throat> and we look at the new university hospital, the University of Montreal Hospital Center that just opened up the, in the early 2020. We are talking now 10 machines, five are generics, four that are specialized to certain types of transfer and one cyber knife that I will talk a bit later on about. And then we have um, around no, 5,000, um, um, what, 3,500 3, patients and get 40,000 fraction. A fraction is a treatment. Like one patient that sits one time on a machine is one fraction. Okay, and then the appointments are not equal. They go from 25 to, um, to 50 minutes. Um, and so we decided, or we we uh, figured out that we couldn't run our you know, fancy stochastic method because it would just take too much time and wouldn't be precise enough because there was too much variability. So, um, we decided to go for something based much more on machine learning and trying to predict what would be the best time to start a patient and, and predict the best slot to start um, um, the treatment. So this is our, the, the cases, like I mentioned before. Um, now they have a little bit more of P1 here. They have 15%, sorry. Um, they have um, uh, average with me, sorry, I don't have the proportion. Yes, you see that they have, they don't have much P1s here, but they, they are still most not able to treat them within that one single day. <clears throat> you can see that you have around again, 30% of P2, and then the rest is more or less spread evenly. Okay, and what we want to do here is minimize the overdue time and the waiting time. Okay, so let's, this, this is the way that they are doing it right, right? So let's say that you have, we're here, and that the patient is admitted, okay? And in blue, I have the number of slots which are available on a, a given machine. So let's say I will take a very um, simple example. I have one Linux, so that's one machine that can treat 120 slots of five minutes um, per day, okay? And then I have a P4 that comes and he needs three um, fraction. Okay, and so that's three appointments, eight appointments requiring 10 slots, so 50 minutes uh, each. So I'm looking for a day that has 10 slots, which are open. So normally patient, let's say that I'm putting myself in an online fashion at day zero, patient comes. I need, let's say, uh, a certain amount of day, let's say 10 days, so that the patient is ready to treat. So after day 10, I start looking, okay? Then I see, oh, I could start the patient here at day because I have 15 slots and I need 10. But the problem is that on this day, I only have eight. So I can't fit this patient. So I need to go a bit further and uh, look at day 12. And at day 12, I have 11 slots. And then that's fine. I'm going to book, book the patient here. Now, the issue is that if I'm doing that, I'm leaving one slot open. And that slot is basically waste because the minimum amount of time that someone needs is roughly five slots. So um, that's not very good. But that's the greedy way, and that's the way that they're doing it at the moment. Okay, so that's after admission. This is what is left, and the next patient would look at this. And if I have another 10 slot patient, then again, I need to go to uh, day 14. Okay, um, batch scheduling basically would mean that we we don't want to be in this online fashion, and we want to, to wait until we have more information, right? So we would say, for example, I will I will wait for the whole week, and do nothing and then on the friday okay <clears throat> on the friday i will book all the patients that came during that week and give them appointment for the next week and i can use a mathematical model for doing that because now i have more patient and i can do this in a more a clever way because i can play the tetris game better because i have more patients to schedule in the coming uh, weeks um 
However, this is only for the curative patient. Any palliative patient would be given an appointment right away, right? These people need to be treated in three days. So if we wait five days to give them an appointment, we're already creating delays for them. So you would only create days. So in one sense, you're winning because you're creating flexibility and you have more people that you can schedule at a time. On the other time, you're starting by creating potentially a five-day um, delay for the patient that comes on Monday. You don't deal with this case until the Friday. So you're actually artificially uh, imposing a five days of extra delay for those patients. So there's pros and cons with this method. Okay, now the to get a baseline of what is theoretically possible, we also have what we call the offline scheduling. We assume that we know everything that's to come for the whole year. Um, all the patients are known in advance and we schedule the whole horizon uh, in advance. So <clears throat> we have, uh, let's say, uh, year numbers of, of scheduling. So all future of our patients are known and we schedule everybody at the beginning of the year. So, of course, this is cheating and this is unachievable, but it gives an idea of what is the best possible outcome given a set of patients. Okay, so how do we do that? We have a MIP model, so I'm not going to work, you know, explain necessarily all the details, but the important things is that we have a log function for uh, waiting time and overdue time. We, it's kind of re counterintuitive. Typically, we use quadratic things to pen, pen, penalize maximum deviation, but here we really want to force uh, things to be around zero, and we want to have a high penalty to not be zero, and but we don't want the numbers to get too big because there's just uh, too many patients when we do the offline. And so if we use quadratic, the numbers become just too big, and then uh, the, the value of pushing a patient from one to zero is lost, and, and uh, uh, we have numerical instability. So the log function works well because it uses kind of a weight decay, uh, sending all the patients that those that can be seen at zero uh, delay are seen at zero. Uh, sorry, zero um, uh, lateness are seen as zero lateness. Okay, after that, we have basic stuff. Um, no patients needs to be assigned. They need to be ready to treat. We must not exceed capacity. And we also preserve a little bit of capacity. I think it's five or 10% for the, um, um, for the, 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 the palliative cases. So every day we'll keep a bit of slots for them just to make sure we do have a bit of space. Okay, so... Um, this is not ready for production yet because it does um, lack the intraday scheduling. In a sense, <clears throat> once we have decided on which day they will start, we need to figure out on that day what happens with the therapist treatment, the Tetris game of everybody. And um, and if they are numerous machine, you might have a little bit of imprecision at the frontier. So it's not perfect, but it's a good guess. Okay, and so this is how it's going to work, right? At the, um, the patients admitted at day zero, same example as before. Um, you know, you have only one NAC, and then a patient comes and needs um, a 10 slot appointment uh, on three consecutive days. Now the prediction model could say start on day 13 because that patient is not urgent, it's a P4. And this way, um, sorry, and in this way, you would reduce this one by 10 but uh, you still have eight slots and then these have a lot of capacity and then you're preserving this eight and this 10 for maybe a P3 patient that needs six slots or no, something at least not, not, uh, not more than eight, but you're preserving those days for more urgent patient or especially for palliative patients, for example, that would need um, um, five slots. You could do them here and then you would not uh, torpedo this day here. So... Um, the question of how does this work and how do we train the this the model to guess what is the, the, the best day? Well, we work with a, a pipeline that looks a bit like that. And I'm going to come back to this twice to, to kind of understand what we're doing. Like we build this and we publish the paper, but we're still working to understand exactly what is it that it is fundamentally doing. Um, so at the beginning you start, you, you, have, you have your problem instances. So we'll just create instances and then you will, um, you will, uh, solve them using the MIP model that I've shown you, right? So once I have a current, sorry, once I have a, a current solution, like that is a complete plan for the whole planning horizon, I'm going to deconstruct the solution to generate training data. So basically, I'm going to put a timestamp saying, okay, let's say on day 20, this on this day, what did I know? Who is already in the schedule? And then I'm going to say that a new patient comes. And then from this, I'm going to extract the feature of the problem. I'm going to come back to those features a bit later. And then I'm going to use as a label the actual date that the optimal model used to start that patient. And so for, from every offline solution, I'm going to generate one 
point or one in one training data point for every patient in that offline solution. Okay. And then I'm going to train a regression model. We look at different types of model. And then from that, now I'm going to test it uh, on a test set. So this is a set of features um, that we use, the set of patient, the LINAC capacity, the uh, admission time point of a patient, the due date, the number of fraction, et cetera. Okay. And so a data point is basically um, these, um, these features that are basically the, the duration, the type, and the, the priority and, and everything. And uh, a C vector, which is basically the context, the, the set of the actual busyness of the machine, right? And this gives me basically the state of the system when a patient is coming. The label is going to get basically when was that patient scheduled using in the offline solution that's been optimized uh, to optimality by a mathematical engine uh, using the MIP model that we've shown, okay? And then I'm going to say that, that this is my estimate of given this state, this is the delay that I should anchor. And then uh, I'm going to test a loss, um, which is going to be the difference between the actual delay and the uh, real delay when I post-optimize like the, the um, when I, when I, because I, I can't really necessarily always put the patient there because it might be busy, the day might be different and so forth. So I'm going to use this as a difference and then I have a, a, a regularization function. But this is traditional, it's just a normal pipeline for regression. So well, first philosophical question, right? Can we consider that this is just um, using a MIP as a labeling machine, right? Because the, the label for my examples, I'm taking this from the optimal solution of a MIP. So you can think of this of unsupervised learning where every patient, sorry, of supervised learning where every patient is, uh, is a data point and every label comes out of a MIP. But if you do this, you, you lose the relation between the same patients, the patient story that, that came from the same instance and were linked together. So the other way to look at this is to look at this X vector and say that is actually a, a state, right? So this is the state. Uh, of the patient <clears throat> and the state of the system. And then I have an action, and then my action is deciding on the number of delay. It's a simple action, right? Do I take 10 days of delay, 11 days of delay, 13 days of delay, et cetera, right? And then my solution, you can, this, you can think that the solution that links all the patients together, that is an episode in the um, in a reinforcement learning, sorry, in a reinforcement learning spirit, the, the MIP has linked all these patients in, a, in an episode. And so the MIP creates an episode and then, um, and then you, you typically train on that. So one could also think of it as inverse uh, reinforcement learning. And so we're finishing a, a, a paper now where we're studying all of these things. Um, okay, so let's test this in practice. We we use a Poisson distribution trained on the real data from the university hospital. I went not allowed to publish the real data, but we, we fitted models on the real data and now we're generating instances based on that. Um, again, the same thing for treatment plans. There are about 40 types of treatment plans or even more, I think. Um, and then we played around using a different numbers of machine and played around with the number of arri arrival rate to do a sensibility analysis. And then at the end, we will test on the real instance, the real data we have for the last years. Um, for each <coughs> instance, um, sorry, we generated, no, so we generated, um, uh, like for each number of Linux, we generate 500 instances. And for the same for each arrival, so for, sorry, for each num com for each combined number of Linux and arrival rate, we generate 500 instances. Um, we use 400 for for training and 100 for uh, for testing. Um, all right, we tested different pipelines or different algorithm. They were kind of more or less comparable with a slight advantage for uh, random forest at training, but that, that would maybe overfit a little, and so we prefer XGB boost. Um, as it turned out, in, in basically more than 90% of what we did in my chair for the last eight years, XGB boost always came out to be the best um, method for us. I think it's uh, it's quite well suited for healthcare data that have uh, correlation and high nonlinearity that this method can capture well. Uh, so we're going to work with that. It has a you no know, average error of about one day. Um, of delay, which is not, not awful. 
Um, this is the that this is what we are going to compare, right? Our our offline is kind of the optimal baseline. Um, it's unbeatable, so let's see how far we are. And then we will do um, the greedy method. So either at the, the greedy here, which is called at admission greedy, is what they would do at the hospital at the moment. <clears throat> Daily greedy is basically you wait until the end of the day to have more patients, and then you sort them, and then you do them greedily. Okay, and then these are the batch method where you wait at the end of the day and solve a MIP, or you wait at the end of the week and solve a MIP, right? And then at the bottom, you have prediction base is basically using the pipeline that I've just uh, shown now. Um, and so how to read this is uh, on the, I mean, more, these are mostly the same. They're kind of delay and, and, and uh, overdue time and waiting time. So just focus on one, it's more or less the same. On the left here, you have offline which is your optimal. The, in the middle, you have all the like the, the greedy and the MIP-based method. And then on the right, you have the prediction base. And what we see is that prediction base behave you know, as close as, as we, possible to the, uh, uh, the offline one by doing the following thing. It's actually, oh, sorry. The first box is P1, P2, P3, P4. So what you look at what you need to do, actually, you need to delay those P4 a bit, right? So the, the offline you see is also putting a little bit more delays on the P4 um, than the other method in order to create space for the P3s and then making sure that there's always room for the, the palliative patient, right? And the other methods, they're kind of focusing a bit too much on the P4s, which is a large, large volume of them. It's doing a bit better on that, but it, there's no more room for the P3s, and then there's huge delays for the other ones. And the prediction method is kind of more mimicking this. It's creating a little bit more delay here, a little bit more delay here, and then it's not so bad for those. So this, uh, <clears throat> apart from being super fast, right, taking like a fraction of a second to take a decision, it's as good as it gets in terms of comparing to an impossible optimal solution. And then we tested on the real uh, data. So then the, the you see arrival rate jumps around a bit. So we used an average of a moving average of 10 patients per day. Um, and then we when we compare, we so this is uh, um, what we get when we compare against a different strategy. And they, like I said, they use more like on the greedy approach. Or we're increasing the waiting time uh, for P3s and P4, but we're really not getting that the, the palliative closer to the target date, right? This would be three days. Now we're at four, but that's now still way better than being at six or even nine or more if you're using the batch method. And the um, the uh, delay is um, is way better. So <clears throat> you have to understand that for the P2s and the P1s, there, there is a side effect that is uncompressible is that the, the weekend actually counts in the delays, but you can't treat. So for any patient that comes on a Friday is basically late because you can't treat them until the Monday or the Tuesday and already on Tuesday, you're one day late. So this is some kind of artifact uh, that is that is part of the of the experiment that we can't really get rid of. After a numerous discussion with them, they don't want to take it out. The nice thing about <clears throat> XGBT methods is that they are explainable. So we can run shaft values on them and understand why are we delaying a patient and saying, for example, like this patient is delayed to 26 days because um, he has a, a big number of fractions, his, uh, his due date is not so important, we have some capacity issue, his duration is this much and so forth. And so we can produce explanation that tell the, the clerks that this is why this patient is getting this so much delay. OK, so let's go back to this to make a little bit more philosophy. Um, so here, um, we, we, do we need to have uh, you know, something called prediction-focused optimization, right? There's something called um, decision-focused learning, right? This is kind of a very trendy method. It kind of generalizes the predict and optimize framework. In this context, it's kind of the reverse, right? In, in a predict, predict and optimize or DFL, decision-focused learning, you're trying to build a, a machine learning pipeline that will take into account the fact that you will run a decision model after. Here, um, maybe if we're doing the reverse, right? We're actually running a decision model in order to train a machine learning pipeline. So what do we need to think about when we do that? Well, first, here are all our, like the right here, on the right, you have your the machine learning pipeline. This one assumes, as any other ML method, that all the labels are ground truth, right? That for that state, 
the label we have is the optimal. It is the only possible label. But there's a lot of symmetry. It's very possible that that patient could have been delayed by a couple of days, and that would have made any uh, difference, especially for P4s. On this side, um, you're running an optimization model, but you assume we assume perfect information, right? We generated scenarios, and then each scenario, when it's manipulated by the optimization engine, is assumed to be a deterministic problem. Uh, which is not the case because in reality, none of these things are going to be variable. And so maybe instead of, of using an offline scheduling based on a deterministic solver, we should use a stochastic program here, but that would you know, probably slow up the, you know, the, the, the process and training time, which is already quite high, would maybe become untractable. So we're also looking at uh, other methods to create uh, data points that are uh, um, more varied uh, and more uh, aligned on the stochastic nature of the problem, but that don't incur to have that. So I realized that I took a lot of time um, to get through the first part, so I might need to breeze through. I think I just have one hour, right? Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. You have, uh, yeah, you have more more time. I mean, it's around 50, uh, 45 minutes and um, fifty minutes for for a question, but you can take more time if you need. Okay. Um, well, I can, um, I can breeze around the other thing and then show you just a bit of how it works. But I uh, that probably would need more time. So the idea is what I was telling you at the beginning, right? So you have um, the machine is shooting to the patient, and the the source of radiation is blocked using these tungsten leaves that are moving, and um, it's uh, it's quite a challenge because the machine is rotating and the leaves are moving, and then you're sending the radiation through the patient. And in the old days, they would call step and shoot. You would position the machine, you would move the leaves, you would light up the lamp, close the lamp, move the machine, move the leaf. Like, so that would be very slow. Now what they do is called a VMAP, which is a, a modulated arc therapy. It basically, the machine moves, you keep the light on, and the tungsten leaves are moving, right? So it's much more subtle in terms of uh, depositing those on the organs and much more precise to hit the target, but way more complicated because now I don't, I don't using like five points of entry. I have 180 points of entry, which is every two degree angle along the body. So how do you solve that? Uh, we worked on this. I'm going to jump a bit around. I don't have the time to get through all the, the details, but it's basically we use a column generation method. Um, and it's basically, we extended the literature to using quadratic based column generation method. And the key of this paper was to actually take into account the delivery time of, um, of the treatment. Now, so it's too sad, I can't really walk you through all those details, but you think about, you have to, to define arcs around the body that meet a lot of the physics of the machine and making sure that the dose is correct for the tumor, but safe for the organs. And uh, I'll jump to the model and the subproblem. And what we did that really make a big difference is using unsupervised learning here to reduce the size of the problem. And that was one of the good tricks that, that worked because when I was talking to the physicists, they said, yeah, in, in the practice, um, like you wouldn't use a, a, a model with tens of thousands of variables that would be too hard to solve. So you would downsample, right? If you have the kidney, and there's 5,000 little uh, uh, no, cubic piece of a kidney, you don't necessarily need to account the radiation. All of them, you can take a sample and that works. Um, we tried that and the results were not so interesting. So we worked on a way to use unsupervised learning to cluster pieces of the body more intelligently. So you can think of the, the every organ as kind of a, a, a legal construction, basically where every legal piece is a voxel. So it's a let's say one millimeter by one millimeter by one millimeter piece. And then you're, you want to, to account the amount of radiation that gets into that piece. So there's really a lot of them. And to reduce the size, what we did is we use k-means, but as a measure of distance, we compare the amount of radiation that hit um, that hit that that tumor. And so if, if two, sorry, that hit that piece of, of voxel. So if two voxel, <clears throat> They are not necessarily one by another, but they get very similar red patterns of radiation. We would merge them in what we call the cluster. And then those cluster would then be modeled and tracked and so forth. And so we could really reduce the size uh, by a factor 20 for normal tissue and by a factor of six for, um, the, um, for the tumors. And running a k-mean, like a modified version of k-mean would do this like in a, basically in one second, you would get this size of reduction. 
And then when we ran the model, let me skip this, but when we ran the model, we obtained uh, <clears throat> performance that were similar. Um, so typically the way that you read this, so this is a multi-objective, you know, multi-dimensional problem where every curve, every color is an objective. And it tells you the amount, the percentage of voxel that, that get a certain amount of radiation. So this point here tells you that um, the right, um, right femoral head, right, the blue curve here, gets 30%, uh, 30% uh, 30 of the femoral head gets no 0.3, uh, sorry, yeah, 30% of the femoral head gets 30 gray of radiation. Okay, and this one would tell you, for example, that this tumor, 70% gets uh, 60 gray. But this one is called PTV56. So mm -hmm. this is planned treatment volume of 56 gray. So you want this to be, like you want this to be basically 95% above 56, right? So we would be around, around here or something like that. And then you want this to fall. So the, the, the tumor curves, you want them to be high up there and then basically fall as fast as possible whenever you hit this number of 56 and 68. The rest you want to be basically on the bottom left as most as possible. And so we found that using the reduction um, actually did not really create problems. It like, even sometimes was way better. So, and you were able to solve the problem in five minutes instead of solving it in half an hour. Okay. And we can see also that we, we could be able, because we would reduce the delivery time, that was the main aspect of the project. Can we treat the, the customer faster? We're able to treat, sorry, the patient faster. We're able to spend, instead of shooting for six minutes, we could shoot for three minutes. So that's half the time spent on the table and basically one to two more uh, patients that are treated per day if we use that method with more or less the same quality. But that was still heavy uh, machinery. And we looked at uh, uh, that can only work for traditional machine. So I'm going to say super fast that we worked as well on the cyber knife, which is a big robot that moves around the patient. And this problem is super complicated because the, the, there's a lot of end points of entry. There's like you're talking now, it's not a circular, it's not a circle, it's a sphere. So every point on a sphere is a possible point of entry. Um, and these treatment, they take like roughly an hour. The patient spends an hour on a table, 70% of which is spent while the robot is moving and not doing anything for treating the patient. <clears throat> so we modeled that with um, reinforcement learning. Unfortunately, I will need to skip the detail because I don't have enough time. But you have an action is moving around the patient. And then you compute the reward as a function of the ratio of the good voxel versus the back voxel that you're seeing from that point of entry. So you can compute that ratio and use that as a reward. And then you, you compute the dose using Monte Carlo simulation. And then once you have that, you build a you know, typical uh, deep Q learning pipeline. And then you can see that actually you can compare, um, again, treatment quality is basically the same. But if you look at the um, time spent on the table, this is what they have. They would you know, treat the patient in 54 minutes and the arm would travel this amount of distance and then uh, the DQN that we have basically cuts this in about half um, and reduces really distance and we can get the solution in one second. Girobi is basically an offline model. Again, that 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 will, not really, it's not an offline model, it's an optimal model. So it will solve this as a mathematical program and it's able to uh, get a little better uh, in terms of treatment quality. So objective is treatment quality. It's better than our method, but it hits the time limits after one hour, so you can't really use it in practice. And we play with some heuristics, but um, again, they're they're not as good trade off of time versus objective than the DQN. So this is also uh, working. So if you want to know any more about treatment planning, ask question around that. I can come back and uh, and talk more about it. But in um, in ritual spec, what the, what we have been really focusing on uh, in the last. Uh, eight years or so and for the uh, the next uh, sorry the last seven years and the seven to come right until 2030 I think we have this funding is really to look at the interplay of, of treatment complexity and treatment time and capacity and dynamism and stochasticity in order to push the use of, of the existing resources to a maximum so that we can uh, treat people more efficiently and uh, and we are using basically data science as general to use that. So either optimization or machine learning and, and especially mixing those in order to achieve uh, the best possible outcome. So I'll conclude with this and happy to take any questions.
Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So now it's, it's time for, for questions. So uh, please, anyone who, who wants to, to ask something, please write your, your name in the in the chat so so we can we can ask in turn right any question or comments or something well i'm going to, to start uh, uh first right Oh, well, Daniel Molina. So, Daniel, please go ahead. I'm not hearing you. Sorry, Daniel, we are not, you are- uh, You're muted again. Yeah, you have to unmute. If you can write the, the question or well, uh, while Daniel is, is writing or, or fixing his, his problem. Uh, I would like to, to ask you something about the, the scheduling because I'm not sure. Uh, are you considering that all the patients are equally important for you? I mean, uh, well, not for you, for the system in terms of imagine that, uh, yeah, depending on the, uh, the kind of treatment the patient need to need, right? They Sometimes it's important to put someone before all the right or, or to reorganize them in a way right so uh, if you're yeah so we use uh, we use this priority level so within one priority class we assume everybody's equal and it's more like a first come first serve um but um in uh, somebody in P3 would be more uh, as a bit higher priority than P4. So now we have a research project and actually more like an industrial research project. We are, um, because we, some of the students and, and, and other faculty, we, we build a company around that, that we build software that is available for hospitals. And we do a bit of research with them. And now we are playing to, to allow them, for example, when a P3 comes, to just reschedule a P4 and call him saying, "Oh, you've been you've been pushed," uh, or some of, for example, they um, like somewhere in this process, you would like in the planning process, you would inform the patient of his appointment, and until that has been that has happened, you are allowed to move the appointment of that person, so we can track of who has been given uh, the piece of paper with their appointment and who has not. And if somebody has not and is not a priority, we can push them down and to, to squeeze somebody that has a higher priority. But the priorities are really by class. Within one class, we assume everybody's the same. Yeah, my, my question was somehow related to the rescheduling, right? Because for instance, I was also thinking to, to something that is, for instance, mean that uh, there is a unexpected situation, right? Imagine that some patient that were waiting die or something, or I don't know, there is a specific- you know, machine breaks or a bunch of things can happen. To, to fix the, or to reschedule everything or to, it's like working in real time, right? So um, mathematically we can do this. We have models that do it. It's not terribly difficult because you're solving the same model but you're, you're fixing pieces of the solution. So it's not very difficult to reschedule. Operationally, it's very, very difficult because when something happens real time, the people, they don't have time and sit in the computer and input, oh, this has changed, it's not has changed. And so capturing the reality of what is disrupted in a piece of software so that you can modify the data accordingly while there is a crisis in the hospital, this is the real challenge. So at the moment, we're not handling the crisis. We're, we're handling, let's say, 
uh, yes, a new priority patient comes and some low priority have, don't have an appointment date anymore yet. See, they, have a, they have a date in the system, but they don't have the date you know, on, the, on a piece of paper. So we can move them. And so this is about to go in production this week, I think, or next week. And we hope, like our experiment in a lab show that we can really reduce the lateness on those priority patients, because normally we would push them in the, at the end. Now we can bring them up and delay the other patients. Um, there's a lot of change management around that. Um, you don't want to do anything that would make the clerk need to call 20 people because they go crazy and they wouldn't do it, right? They would not accept it because, so for example, they would take up, they would prefer to put the patient late than to start calling um, a bunch of people. Like down the road, if people have apps and you know, stuff like that, that could be doable, but cancer patients tend to be old and even SMS is not really reliable. <clears throat> so they rely really on somebody talking to them. Um, Next year, we hope to get to crisis management, but yeah, this is going to be more like UI, UX stuff where how like something happens, you can derive what's the new context, what has changed, what is possible, and then push the solution. And then like when the solver optimizes the solution and you, you need to communicate to a lot of people involved, how do you do this communication efficiently? Okay, thank you so much. Well, Daniel Molina has, uh written something. Thank you for your nice talk, Luis, uh, Luis Martin. Sorry for my technical question. My question is, could be used for the waiting problem more of one object in order to model better the solution, for instance, with the waiting for different type of patients? Sorry, I can't. For some reason, I can't read it. Let me go see. This could Get oh, yes. chat. Yeah. Um, no, I like technical questions. Thanks. Um, for the waiting problem. Um, yeah, so we use um, we use um, delay and waiting, and there's a there's a different weight per class of patient, right? So uh, P two P threes have a higher weight than P four and P2s have a higher weight, and then there's a weight for every day of delay, and then there's a higher weight for being late. So this is, um, um, yeah, this is what we do at the moment. But this is not, uh, the science of putting the weight is um, is still pretty uh, no, artisanal, as I say. It's kind of a, in the reality, in the in the real software that's deployed, we also do the, the very detailed scheduling of what goes a day. And so the objective has a lot of stuff, like, uh, oh, they should have breaks, they should have this and that, and then the, the machine should do this at that time of the day. And then there's a lot of, of tiny things. For example, one thing we do, and that's really a mess, is trying to give, if patient comes 30 times, we try to give him an appointment at the more or less the same time for the 30 appointment. But then if you have a maintenance, then you either go in the afternoon or you switch machine. And then, so there are penalties for that. And there's there's a lot of penalties. And the moment there's, when we did the first hospital, we calibrated that with them. Now we're going to four or five hospitals uh, this month. Um, I think it becomes a challenge. So in my past year, I was involved in a company called Planora and we were doing scheduling for um, uh, call centers and doctors and, and uh, people in retail industry. And, and it became a mess to calibrate the weights. And so we had a, an algorithm so you would sort priorities. And so the user could say what's important. Because if you ask the user, is this important? They will say yes. And they would, after one week, everything would be at the... Uh, I've said that the, the joke that I always tell is when, when with the first verse, first of the version of the, the software for doctors in 2002, they had no important, uh, a bit important, no relatively important, then important. And then they said, oh, everything was important after like two schedules. And then they say, oh, this and this is more important. So we had very important, and extremely important. And after a month, everything was extremely important. And, and so you cannot ask people to give a weight or stuff. You have to, sh it's a relative game, right? So you have to put the user in face of this relative game. So then we had hierarchies and within hierarchies, you had sub hierarchies and then all the priorities were, all the things were there. And then we say, you sort them, right? But you needed to sort them like one by one on a scale. And so only one thing could be at the top. And then you had to go down like that. And that forces them to go, and then from this kind of two-stage hierarchical structure, we generated weights that uh, um, met the, the precision um, space that CPLEX allowed at the time. Now we're working with a new solver called CPSAT from Google that has basically an infinite precision uh, space because it's using it's not relying solely on the linear relaxation. It's relying on something else. And so that is also a bit dangerous. Now we can just use weights that span more space. 
in theory, now we, we still have a, a, a set of experiments to come out whether that is the case or not. But uh, the, the setting the weights is, is at the moment an art, but we're trying to make that more of a science in the coming months because it's uh, we're hitting the limit of that. Perfect. Uh, another question for uh, Aurora. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you so much for this nice presentation. My question is uh, how you validate the effectiveness of this problem, the, of the weighting problem, uh, like in terms of which statistics or which uh, mm, yes, issues are you measured and if you have some kind of ground truth or you uh, talk with the, the doctors, like if if this system is better than the the things that they uh, were doing before? Um, this is also a very good question. So what we did in the papers is we ran an experiment against a heuristic that mimics, in theory, what they should be doing, and then the perfect information. And then we tried to be in there. The doctors are not involved in that process. They are managers. Having a manager look at the year schedule and tell us, you know, do you think this could have been done in this way or that this that doesn't happen? It's just too complex for them. So in the papers, we have a very academic way of evaluating that. In reality, it's more of a day by day. So we deploy the system and then we see when they override it because they, they can just take manual decision. And one thing we saw, for example, is that at the university hospital, they started double booking because they, they know that their duration times are too high. And rather than sending somebody to be late, they would actually double book it in the system. So it took a while to try to get to that. We tried to understand that it doesn't make sense. Like there cannot be two patients on the same um, no, table at the same time. But in the end, we realized that it's true because their durations are not exact. And then they want to go to the model new durations, but then the staff is resisting because the staff thinks they are going to work more if they reduce the time, which is not the case because they're actually double booking. So it's a very... And then we are looking to create um, um, a, a true evaluation analysis of how much this is doing better in practice. So then you would need a counterfactual, like for this month, what would happen if they would not have the system? It is extremely difficult to do in practice because tips thing changing all the time. There are a bunch of exceptions and then recording how was it, like just knowing exactly what was the state of the system when a decision was taken is sometimes very difficult because sometimes they have a maintenance, but they didn't tell into the system, but the clerks knew there was a maintenance, right? But it wasn't in the system yet. So then they took a decision knowing that, and then we didn't, and then we know they have to undo it after and something like that. So having a true, a ground fruit um, of what would have been a whole year of scheduling uh, is very difficult. We have a thing in chemotherapy where they adopted it in one day, they went from not using it to using it. So then if we compare like the two weeks before the week, two weeks after, we see like 10% more patients in the system. Or so that, that was a real thing. But that was more about treating more people. Uh, the delay thing, uh, we have uh, some testimony from one hospital saying that since they've been using the system, they've never had such low delay. So in the 10 years. So say, and we had, this is the best delay we've ever had in 10 years due to using the system. But on a certain sense, they also have new clerks that are young and tech savvy and that drive of using technology. And before they had older clerks that were doing things on paper and that were maybe not as fast. So can you say it's technology, is the person, it's a mix of an intelligent person and technology. I would like to have a recipe to be able to, to show like to an hospital, basically use this. This is how exactly, this is a scientific experiment that will tell you how the delays are going. In practice, is very hard to do from us. I mean, you can do it from a marketing perspective by making everything, you know, with pink glasses. But from a, a very scientific experiment, it still remains a challenge. But we are, the feeling we get from the ground and the comments is very positive. The people really like it because they see their their stress level in the clinic goes down. They schedule more. The patients are, are according to them, treated faster and they treat more and so forth. So the, the, the actual field feedback is extremely, extremely positive from the users. Okay, thank you. Well, I, I think that here in Spain, it's almost impossible to apply this kind of technology because of the legal aspect of uh, 
if you go to a hospital in order to apply something like this, to, like scheduling and so on, it's like, it's, I think it's almost impossible to, <laughs> that someone want to, to, to consider this technology here and to, in order to reorganize patients and so on. I don't know if it's- We're talking with hospitals in Belgium. Here, here but here, the legal aspect for 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 every for anything, right? It's 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 horrible, right? That could be interesting because we're talking with Belgium, and they ask about like if you are GDPR compliant, and you install all the technology on their server in their wall, then you don't have any kind of privacy issue because everything stays within the security of the hospital. Um, that worked well. So this is so. I mean, what I do on the research side with a student is everything I say is on generated data, and we're trying to understand which algorithm seems to work or not. Everything that the people do in the company that is not research, and so they can sign all the legal agreements. Some of this is not published; the data are never shared, and so this is the only way that you get live. But it is true that IT and legal are the most difficult barriers to entry. It is not that the practitioner they really want it, but then IT has a bunch of ideas of what they don't have time to do it this year. And then legal would also you know, have their uh, own uh, preoccupation about why or the risk that this kind of software could in their head um, put forward. Yeah. yeah. Well, so this is the end of this, uh, of this interesting talk. Uh, again, thank you so much, Professor Russo, for for your nice talk, uh, for for the interesting question and and, and answers. And well, I, I hope to uh, I would like to invite all of you to to come to the next uh, webinar. Right, um, that's all. Have a, a nice afternoon um, and see you see you soon. Right. Thank you so much.